Good morning, church family. Hope everybody's doing well. If you can stand, we are going to start by singing this morning. Here we go. One, two. A one, a two. A one, two, three. All I want, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. I sing all my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. God is for me, God is for me. He's not against me. I will hold to the plans he has for me. When I'm broken, he will fix me. I will call on the name of the Lord. Let's sing it. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. I said, all my my sorrow. He's my hope and my strength for tomorrow. When the storms rise all around me, I will call on the name of the Lord. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. joy. I got joy, joy, joy deep in my soul. Let's keep singing this morning. that could buy my dreams you are better than all these things the prettiest face to turn their eyes beauty that could hypnotize the open doors that looks may bring you are better than all these things your love is a better important one in every room status matched by only kings you 
are better than all these things. Your love is better than life. You are the well that won't run dry. I have tasted and I have seen. You are better than all these. Your love, your love is better than life. You are the well that won't run dry. I have tasted and I have seen. You are better than all these things. Being liked and loved by everyone. Approval that outshines the sun. Cheered by all who think of me. You are better than all these things. Yes, you are better than all these things. Your love is better than life. You are the well that won't run dry. I have tasted, I have seen. You are better than all these things. Your love is better than life. You are the well that won't run dry. I have tasted and I have seen. You are better than all these things. Yes, you are better than all these things. I know you are better. Oh, I know. You are better than all these things. I know you are better than all these things. Lord, I know you are better than all these things. I know you are better than all these things. Yes, I know you are better than all these things. Oh, I know. Better than all these things, Lord, I know you are better than all these things. I know you are better than all these things. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. And a special happy Father's Day to all the dads out there today. Can we just give them a big round of applause? All right. Woo. You're the best. You're the best dads, right? So glad that you chose to be with us instead of the church on the green or the church on the lake or whatever it may be today. So that's good that you're here, and uh, we're very glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us today, let me say welcome as well. And if you would, we'd love to connect with you. Just grab uh, one of the communication cards out of the, uh, the seat in front of you right there and uh, fill that out, and you can drop it in the boxes in the back there, the offering boxes, or take it to the Welcome Center. We have a gift there that we'd like to put into your hands and answer any questions that you might have about Southern Lakes. And, and by the way, if you have any prayer requests, anything else that you want to let us know, all-purpose communication card, please do that and just drop them in the, in the boxes on the back right there. So glad that uh, we can have this time together and uh, for the good things that God is doing in our midst. Let me just say thank you as well for your faithfulness in giving uh, as you've continued to worship God in your tithes and offerings, even though we're not passing the plate as we normally would. Uh, we've got the giving boxes in the back, and the best way to give, of course, is what? Do it online. You can do that through our app or go right to our website, and it's a real easy uh, process once you're set up, and it's pretty easy to get set up, and you can just have recurring giving, that kind of thing. It's a great way to do that, and we appreciate so much uh, your faithfulness uh, at this time, especially right now for our church to keep uh, carrying on in the things that we're doing, and your gifts make that all possible. Uh, let's have a word of prayer this morning uh, and uh, continue to look to God for the service that he has given us. Father. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together to honor fathers uh, on this special day and to honor you. You are our great and almighty God and Father. And I just pray that you would bless this service, uh, bless our, our gifts of worship to you, uh, our tithes and offerings as well. Uh, God, may we continue to look to you and seek you and to give you the glory. Pray that you would bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and continue to worship with us? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a 
Before we sing this last song, I just uh, want to say just a couple, couple of words. Um, a few months back, I was reading the book of Romans. Who's, who's read the book of Romans? Some of you? Good, good. Um, this isn't a Bible school class, but the uh, book of Romans is wonderful in theology. It teaches so much about who God is and who we are as, as God's people. And I was reading Romans chapter 6, and Romans chapter 6 talks about the fact that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we have been alive, made alive in Christ. And it actually says that we are now slaves to God. And you might think to yourself, like, wait, that, wait that's, that's bad. No one wants to be a slave to anyone. And that would be bad if it were being slaves to anyone but God. But being a slave to God is actually a beautiful, beautiful picture of our dependence upon him, our need for him, our loyalty to him, our fellowship as we follow and, and continue to look to him for everything that we have and everything that we are for purpose, for meaning, for direction. This morning I, I felt very compelled um, to remind us about something. Sin is really something that we need to take seriously. We look at a world around us and I think we get confused to think that it's all kind of this person doing this or or racism, or this politician, or this selfishness, and, and all those things are true, and yet, at the core of all of that is the reality that every single one of us, apart from God, is completely shackled by sin. And it's so important that we understand what sin is, because if we don't, how can we understand the salvation of Jesus Christ? Sin is dark. Sin is a problem. Sin is a curse. Jesus saved us from that. He brought us life. He gave us purpose. A 
few months back as I was reading Romans 6, I was inspired to write um, a song we've actually sang here uh, many times. It's called Bound. I want to pull up the lyrics of the chorus for just a moment here. And as we sing this today, I want us to think about what we're singing. He, Jesus, took my sin. He bore my shame. He paid the price. He paid it all. Not so that I could keep on living in sin, that I could continue to be a slave to sin, but that I could be changed, my heart could be changed and being given over to God for his purpose and for his glory. No longer a slave to my pride, pride being the very heartbeat of our sin that we know better than God, right? No longer a slave to my pride because I've been raised to life, true life, the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. No longer lost, I am found, and now I'm bound for heaven for eternity, and I'm bound to my Father in heaven, God, because of Jesus. Let's remember that and sing this and declare it together today. Jesus knows my story, how I thought I'd overcome, and so often I can fail to remember where I was and what he saved me from. He took my sin, he bore my shame. He paid it all for me so my heart could be changed. No longer a slave to my pride, I have been raised to life. I am found, I am found in Jesus. will always fight against surrender but your Holy Spirit draws me near He took my sin He bore my shame He paid it all for me so my heart could be changed No longer a slave to my pride I have been raised to life I am found, I am bound in Jesus Christ. I was found in the darkness, my sin was holding me. I was bound for his judgment for all eternity. But then Jesus took and broke my chains, I'll never be the same I am. I am found, now I'm found in his presence, his hands are holding me, I am bound for his heaven with all his family, because Jesus came and broke my chains, forever I am changed, I am found. could be changed, no longer a slave to my pride, I have been raised to life, I am found, I am bound, he took my sin, he bore my shame, he paid it all for me, so my heart could be changed. No longer a slave to my pride, I have been raised to life, I am found, 
I am bound in Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, my prayer this morning is that we would each take sin seriously. If we know you, if we have accepted your gift of salvation, we've accepted your grace, your love, in doing so, we made the choice to repent. We made the choice to turn away from the world, to turn away from sin, and to be saved and rescued and redeemed by you and your Holy Spirit working within us. Father, I pray this morning that each and every one of us would be convicted of that. That we would hear your voice. We would hear you speak through your word. And that your Holy Spirit would convict us. That we would know truth. And that we would be slaves to you and only you. That we would bring you glory and honor and praise. That every word that comes out of our mouth, every action... We come for you, Lord, for your glory, for your honor, for your praise. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, once again, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Uh, Special happy Father's Day to Josiah. It's his first one, so that's awesome, right? All right. <clears throat> first time the charm. My wife was reminding me today that uh, this is like my 30th Father's Day, so a uh, few, few more down the road and all of that. Uh, although I think, I think you might be getting old already, Josiah, playing the air drums up here. You guys didn't get that, okay? So... He's just beating on the pad. All the rest of it's just pumped in. You know that, right? It just <laughs> looks like that. It's great. Well, what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Um, this message is not geared just to fathers. Uh, I'm going to make some specific application along the way to the dads, and we're going to have a time of blessing for them at the end. But the message, we're going to continue with our series, and it uh, is not just specifically to fathers, but to all of us. In, in what we've been talking about here. And, and the series is called Blessings in Disguise. And we've been learning to recognize those blessings of God that don't always, you know, appear right out immediately to us. And so what are those blessings in disguise? It's those things that we don't immediately see. What we usually do is we fix our attention on the problem or the difficulty or the trial in our lives. I mean, that's natural, right? Boom, here it is, and we got to deal with that. But uh, what often comes in on the backside of that, or even simultaneously as we, we learn to look for it, is this blessing of God in disguise. And, and if we learn to look for that blessing in disguise, uh, we're going to see it a lot quicker and uh, we're going to adjust to it a lot better. Uh, what God has said is this. He, he really loves us, but it, it brings it out in this verse, Romans eight twenty eight. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, to the to those who are called according to his purpose. And as I've pointed out in the past, this is a conditional promise. Uh, a lot of people just kind of quote this verse and uh, apply it universally like, okay, it's all going to be good for all of us. No, it's specifically to those who love God, to the called according to his purpose. And so for those who love God, that are following God, that are in his plan and walking with God, we can expect great things to happen. We can expect those blessings, those good things of God to come to us, even if it seems like they're not there. And, and so our prayer for the series has been a threefold prayer, and I hope you're praying this along with me. I'm praying it for myself. I'm praying it for you, that we would have this uh, adjustment, adjustment of our thinking. It all starts there. Uh, what we think is what we are. And, and so much has to do with the battle right up here in our minds. And so we have to learn to think right. We have to think that, hey, God's up to something good. I might not see it right now. I might not even see it this side of heaven. But, but I'm trusting in a great God, a good God, and, and he's got good things in store. And so we've got to adjust our thinking. We have to adjust our attitude. Many times our attitude is really sour. 
uh, trials and difficulties come our way, and we get angry. And, and, and we don't see what God is up to, and we complain, and, and we, we go the opposite way. And what we have to do is we have to learn to give thanks in all things, is what God has asked us to do, and have, have that right attitude, as so much is part of that. And then finally, to have a, an adjustment of our focus. Uh, instead of focusing on the problem and, and all the bad stuff associated with that, we got to look at the upside to everything there and learn to focus on God and trust him. So if we'll do that, if we'll adjust our thinking and our attitude and our focus, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to see those blessings in disguise in a whole new way. We're going to see God's blessings in a whole new way. And we're going to be the kind of people that are thankful, that are joyful, that are making this world a better place to live. And believe me, we need some more people like that right now that are helping this world be a better place to live. So we've been <clears throat> talking about a, a couple of things so far, a couple of blessings in disguise. The first one we talked about two weeks ago was this blessing of maturity. And, and the way we explain that from James is this is how it works. God, God brings or allows difficulties in our lives, trials if you would, and those trials lead us to patience, and then patience when it has its perfect work uh, means that we become complete or mature. We become more and more like Jesus. There's a pruning process that takes place at times. And God is working in our lives in these trials, if we'll allow them and we'll submit to what God's doing in our lives, will help us to become more like his son Jesus and there'll be a maturity that comes. So here's the trial, but on the backside of that or in the process is that blessing in disguise, which is becoming more like Jesus. We wouldn't sign up for it. That's not what we want, but God blesses us in it. Uh, the second one we talked about last week was this, this blessing of simplicity, uh, when COVID-19 hit, everything kind of got shut down and, and, and schedules got rearranged and changed and we found ourselves kind of locked up, so to speak. And, and we had this time on our hands, many of us. Not everybody, but many of us. And there's this new opportunity for simplicity. And as we talked about last week, if we're not careful, we keep putting things back on the plate and we're gonna lose that blessing of simplicity and what really matters. We talked about priorities last week and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more this week because this week we're gonna talk about clarity. And, and this one, you're going to have to think a little bit more deeply with me today on this one, because what we're talking about here is focus. We're talking about right priorities. What we're talking about is what is most important in this life. And, and the trials, if you would, like COVID-19, when that hit, uh, if we submit to that and we look to God in all of that, what it can do is it can bring about a clarity in our lives where we're focused on the right things. We, we have better and, and clearer priorities and there's clarity that comes in our lives rather than the fog that often comes from all of that. When COVID-19 hit, uh, as we've talked about, life as we knew it basically changed, Right? So things got canceled, things like the Olympics. I'm still bummed about that, looking forward to that this next month, but it's just not gonna happen. I mean, think about all those Olympic athletes and how tough it is on them. I mean, my underwater basket weaving uh, event got canceled, I, I can't believe it. You guys gotta wake up this morning, that's all I got to say, okay? Uh, the jokes don't get any better, they just kinda go downhill from there, so humor me a little bit, laugh at them even if they're not funny. But life changed just like that. Here, here's something else that happened is we all got quarantined. I mean, we were stuck in our houses, so to speak. Many, many people, unless you were essential, right? And, and you were there and those four walls start to cave in on us and we got all those trials that are happening. And before we know it, the next thing that comes on us, we're all asked to wear a mask. We talked about this one a couple weeks ago. Somebody that really didn't like wearing a mask so much, they said, you know, this kind of cuts off my breathing and stuff. And so they, they cut a hole in their mask right there. So if it comes down to us having to wear masks here, all of us, all the time, and I have to pre through the mask, it's going to be kind of hard, but that's what I'm going to do. I'll just blow a hole in there and we'll be all set to go. That'll be fun, right? All these trials, all these things that come into our lives through COVID-19 and this pandemic and other things applied across the board in your life. The point is this, if, if we embrace the trial and we seek God in the midst of it, what's going to happen? Out the other side of that, that blessing in disguise we're going to have is going to be clarity. There's going to be a, a refinement of our purpose and, and our priorities in our lives. Now, when COVID-19 hit, we as a church... <laughs> 
uh, we were kind of caught off guard. I mean, nobody saw this coming, never been through it before. And uh, we were in this state of what I call kind of fog that happened initially, okay? There's all this fog, like, where are we going? I mean, what do we need to do now? What's the next step? And so the staff and I had to talk, and, and the elders, and we, we talked, and we, we had to see our way out of this. Like, what are we going to do next week, and the week after, and the week after? And there was all this fog. That's the trial that comes, and it came for all of us. But what did we do? What we did is we sought God in the midst of that trial. We said, okay, God, what, what's this all about? What's really important? What do our priorities need to be? And what God brought out of that then was what? Because we sought him, he brought clarity. And it was interesting to find out that God had actually gone before us and prepared us for such a time as this. Because if you recall, when we hit the ground running in the new year, what was the series, the first series of the new year? It was 2020 Vision right? And we began talking at that point about what are our priorities? What is most important? What has God called us to do? What does God's word say? And, and we put an emphasis there and we said a great commitment to the great commandments and the great commission is going to grow a great church. And we started talking about the fact that God wants us to focus on those two great commandments to love him supremely and to love others selflessly. And we began to talk about what he's called us to do, which is to make disciples. And so uh, at the beginning of the year, even God gave us clarity of our, of our mission and where we were to go and what we're supposed to do. So as we began seeking God when COVID-19 hit, what came back around was, I've already given you your marching orders. I've already given you clarity. This is your mission. So all we had to do was, was hearken back to that and say, okay, how do we do this? How, how do we continue to love God and love people, make disciples at this time? And, and we're still doing that. Week by week, because nobody knows the future and what's going to happen. Uh, we, are, we are out of here for nine weeks where we're meeting online only, and this is our fifth week back already. It's amazing how quickly it goes. But each week, we're, we're learning how to do all of this. And I remember at the beginning talking about this and saying, listen, if three months, six months, a year from now, whatever it is, we look back and we can say we have loved our people well, then we've done really good. And I think we can say that thus far. And that's our continued commitment is to continue to point to God and love God and to love our people well and to love others as God has loved us and as, as we should love and, and continue to make disciples and see people developed to become more like Jesus. But you see, that's what happens uh, for you, for me, whatever that trial is, it, it kind of starts out as fog, like, whoa, what just happened? Have you ever been driving down the highway and all of a sudden, boom, fog hits you out of nowhere, you go down to a valley, it's like, whoa. You know, you hit the brakes and you slow down. Oh, what does that cause you to do? It causes you to pause until you get some clarity, and that's what we're talking about here today. That's how it works in our lives. We can either move toward God or we can move away from God. We can either get clear on our priorities or we can continue to live in the fog. Now, what I want to do is look at a, a time in the life of Paul. So turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 16. This is when Paul and Silas uh, were in Philippi, and it, it, it's a little bit longer story. We're not going to read the whole thing, so I hope you'll read the rest of it at home and even the, the verses that precede this. The book of Acts is amazing. I love the book of Acts. And so you got to go in and you got to read it and spend some time there because it just lays the foundation for Christianity and all that happened. But as we look at this episode in the life of Paul, what we see is how he responded, how him and Silas responded, and some others. We're going to see three different examples here of how to respond in the midst of trials. So I'm going to pick it up in verse number 16, and we're going to read down through verse 34. Chapter 16 of the book of Acts. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Okay, so get the picture here. Here's a young lady who is possessed by a demon. 
uh, somehow the mas- her masters, her slave masters, had uh, harnessed her ability to foretell the future and do divination. And I don't know what all she did there, but they would kind of like be in the marketplace and come on up and we'll tell you your fortune and just pay us some money. And, and they would capitalize on all that and make some money off of her. Verse number 17, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. That always strikes me as kind of crazy. You know, the demon possessed girl is going around just preaching the word of God basically and, and there's truth there. And she did this for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed And that's an interesting one. He was distressed or annoyed at all this. It troubled him, if you would. Um, What did he do? He turned and he said to the spirit, the evil spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. And so Paul cast out the demon from this young lady. Great thing, right? God is at work here in an amazing, miraculous way. But how did the other people respond? Verse number 19. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And so her masters were not pleased because their profitability was taken away from them. And instead of rejoicing in the goodness of God, they were, they were just in it for themselves selfishly. Uh, they looked to the magistrates. They looked to the authorities. They turned them in, and then they were beaten. Paul and Silas were beaten with rods. Now, I don't know if you've ever been beaten with rods, but it doesn't sound like a very pleasant affair. And that's one of the things about the Apostle Paul. He was beaten over and over again and imprisoned over and over again, and he kept on for the Lord. What an amazing testimony that he has. And here's one of those examples. He was beaten with rods, verse 22. Verse 23 picks up, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. So get the picture. They're bloody, bloody backs. They've been beaten badly, um, and, and now they're put in stocks. Their feet are locked in. They're in the inner prison. They're stuck there. Uh, they got to be dejected, right? Uh, they got to be disappointed and depressed and ready to give up. But what do they do? Look at verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And so the prison, the, the prison keeper, uh, he knew this was a death sentence. He would be held liable for the escaped prisoners. He, he supposed that they were all uh, unshackled and able to get away, and he was just going to commit suicide in the midst of this. Paul says, don't do it. We're all still here. God's at work. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. By the way, those are very important verses. What do I need to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house, and they took them that same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. And so in the middle of the night, they have a big baptism service. Uh, The new believers are coming into the church. And now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. So we see here three different examples. Uh, All these people experienced trials in their life. And what happened? Well, first of all, the slave girl's masters, what did they do? Did they seek God in this? No, they didn't. 
they, they went the other way. They weren't seeking God and they didn't continue seeking God. And, and they had disastrous results. Paul and Silas, though, they were seeking God. They continued to seek God. And you see what happened with them. They had joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And they were singing and praising God and praying to God at midnight. What an amazing testimony of what was going on in their lives. And then the Philippian jailer. How about him? Now, uh, he was all distressed. He was looking the long, wrong way. He was ready to kill himself. He was only thinking about himself in that situation. And then God entered in, and he saw God at work. He saw the earthquake. He had the right question. He said, what do I need to, need to do to be saved? And he gave his life to Christ and his household. And you see the fruit right there where he, he treated the prisoners correctly and all that he did in his life. And so he sought God. Even though he wasn't seeking God, he adjusted and then began to seek God. Three different examples, three different ways that you can go uh, with all of this. And here's how it works. I just had to spell it out so it's like crystal clear for us. We start out with a trial, a difficulty, a problem, whatever it is in our life. We all have them, right? If you're living life, you're going to have trials, you're going to have difficulties. James says it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You have various trials that come into our lives. We all have them. The question is, how do we respond so we have a trial, and then we have a choice. We can respond in one way or another. We'll get that in a second. And then based on how we respond, that's going to determine the actual result that we get in our lives. So here's how it breaks down a little bit more further. We have this trial. If we seek God, that is our response. What's going to happen? Out of that, one of the blessings in disguise, and there are many, but one of the blessings in disguise is going to be clarity, the thing that we're talking about here today. We're going to have a better focus and right priorities and all that God has for us. If we don't, though, we go the other way. We ignore God or we choose some other path. What does it lead to? It leads to confusion not blessing, not clarity. Uh, we're in the fog. We kind of stay in the fog, if you would. Uh, you think about the examples here um, in the story. Uh, the slave girl's masters, they didn't seek God, right? And, and it resulted in anger and injustice and violence, they stayed in the fog. By the way, that makes me think about a lot of the current events happening in our world right now. It really does. A lot of the anger and violence and the injustice and the selfishness and all that's coming out of that. What we need today, okay, this is like a little side sermon, but what we need today is we need God. Uh, go back one slide if you would. Go back to how this works. We have a trial. We, we have difficulties happening there. George Floyd's death. COVID-19, whatever it is. We need to seek God. When we ignore God, this is what we have. We have confusion. We have confusion. That's what happens. That's where our world is at. And that's not the best. What is the best is when we seek God and we have clarity. And that's what God wants us to have is the clarity of his priorities and, and to fix the things that are broken. Go on to uh, the other examples here. Paul and Silas, what did they do? Uh, they sought God right? And good things came of that in their lives and their testimony. We're still talking about them to this day and, and raising up their example is one I want to follow. That's what I want to be like in my life when I'm faced with trials. I want, to, I want to stay true to God. I want to look to him. I want to pray to him. I want to praise him in the midst of the trial. And then you have uh, the Philippian jailer. And, and maybe this resonates with some of you that, you know, this is your testimony. You came to Christ because of the difficulties that were happening in your life. Many people are that way. You see, when everything's fine, we don't need God. But then when, when things happen and difficulties come our way, it's like, okay, what's this about? And we seek God. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, all through the Bible, you see this, this uh, ebb and flow of the children of Israel, right? Uh, when everything was going fine and God was blessing them, they're like, oh, what do I need God for? And they pushed him off to the side and they ignored him. And then what came? All kinds of confusion. All kinds of difficulty, all kinds of sin and heartache and despair. But then they're like, oh, wait a minute. We need to seek God. And they'd get back and they'd get right with God. And then what would happen? You'd see the other side of that equation where they would seek God and then there would be clarity in their purpose and who they were, the people of God, and the blessings of God would come in their lives. The question is, 
What will you do? How will you respond in the midst of your trials and difficulties? We all have a choice. If you do seek God, or let me say it this way, if you do not seek God, you're going to have confusion. And, and that's what we often do, right? Um, instead of looking to God, what do we do? We, we look to other things. We have this pain within, and so instead of seeking God, we seek other things, like we try to self-medicate. And we, and we turn to drugs, or we turn to alcohol, or we, we, we turn to other addictions like food and, and pornography and, and things that we think are going to satisfy us, things that are going to give us pleasure, things that, that we think are going to help us out. But they don't help the situation, do they? Uh, we look to other sources, like maybe some friends or the government or, or finances, and we say, well, they'll bail us out of all of that. And some of those things can help for a little time in some ways, but they're not the answer. The answer is seeking God. And so there's a better way, and the better way is to seek God. If you do seek him, that's when you're going to have clarity, and all these blessings are going to come, and you're going to have more blessings in your life. Blessings maybe you didn't even know. I, I was reading yesterday, and I didn't include this in, in the message because it, it just was yesterday morning, but I was reading Proverbs chapter 3 in my devotional time, and I came across verses 5 and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Uh, it just applied so much. I'm like, oh, I got to put that in. So I, I stuck it in my notes here, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It is we, we need to just seek God, and he's going to direct our paths. He's going to give us clarity in our lives. Sometimes we don't even know we need that clarity. And, and I don't know, you, you're, you're, you're like... You're going along one day and then everything changes. You know, you could have a car wreck or you could have a financial wreck or you could have a relationship wreck and maybe you find yourself in the midst of a divorce or uh, you, you run up against a health problem or, or something happens in your life and you've got a choice. Uh, you're either going to seek God or you're going to ignore God. And if you seek God, you're going to be blessed. It's going to bring about clarity. Clarity comes in many different forms. We talk about a few of those. Clarity of our purpose. That's understanding who you are and, and, and what you need to do with your life. What is your purpose? Uh, Paul and Silas understood their purpose. Uh, we talked last week about this in terms of purpose and priorities. Matthew 6 and verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's God's purpose in our lives. And that's what we need to have. So let me just make a, a special application right now to dads. Okay, Father's Day. What is your purpose? Well, one of your purposes is to be a great dad. Your father, step up to the plate, right? Knock it out of the park. Be a great dad. You can do this, right? But, it, but it's going to take some focus. It's going to take some priority in your life, and it's going to take clarity to say, you know, this is my priority. Is it your priority? Is it your purpose in life to be a great dad? If it is, then you're going to be paying attention to the kids. Uh, they say one of the greatest things a dad can do for his family and his kids is to love their mom. So taking care of your marriage, right? Uh, we talk about priorities. We talk about God first, you know, husband, wife second, kids third, serving God. You know, you got to have that, which leads us to the next thing, okay? So we can talk about clarity of priorities as well because purpose and priorities go together. And our priorities are like, what's most important? What do I need to do? What does God have for my life? Uh, if you think about the Philippian jailer, his priorities weren't correct, but then he reevaluated and he came back around and he said, okay, God, what are my priorities? That's what we need to do in the midst of things. And then there's clarity of planning. Uh, planning to make changes, changing uh, our life and our schedule because failure to plan leads to failure. And what we have to be is we have to be intentional about these things. And that's what the trials, my friends, can do to us. They can help us to be intentional about how we live our life. So important. Now, last week I, I shared with you uh, some of the blessings in disguise that people were sharing with me, and I just like to pass them along, and I, I, I changed uh, the names of the guilty to protect the innocent and all that kind of stuff, so you can't figure out who wrote what, hopefully. But uh, I want to share a couple more with you today. 
Uh, and, and here's the first one. And by the way, you can still send those in to me. I'd love to hear them. I'm, I'm so blessed. And I just want to pass uh, some of them along to you. So here's the first one. When we were at my daughter's, we noticed that our two grandsons were exhibiting unusual bouts of extreme anger for their ages. They would yell things at their parents like, you're not the boss, and I don't have to listen to you. It looked like things were falling apart in the home. My son-in-law had been traveling quite a bit, leaving my daughter alone with the boys for days at a time. Then COVID-19 broke out. All business trips were canceled indefinitely. My son-in-law is now working from home. The boys get lots of time to be with their father, whom I believe is a key figure in their lives right now. My daughter is happy and relaxed. The family is healthy. Family bonds have been reestablished. I look at them now, and I see a blessing in disguise. Isn't that powerful? And, and, and this is the key, the key right here. The boys get lots of time to be with their father. That's what was missing whom I believe is a key figure in their lives right now. Dads, you are a key figure in your sons' and daughters' lives right now. You see, trials come. Trial came. How do you respond? And in this case, he responded. There was some simplicity there, but I think there was clarity that came out of this. And I know this has been an aha moment for a lot of dads. I've heard this from a lot of people. Uh, that they were going and busy and just, you know, providing for the family, all good things, but too busy. And neglecting the right priorities. And, and so with being home and being with their family, they had a chance to reestablish some of those right priorities. Hang on to that. Don't lose it, right? Right? Nobody can do your job for you. Nobody can replace dad. And by the way, I'm just going to throw this in as well. Just think about this. Many of the problems we're seeing in society today can be traced back to what? The disintegration of the home, the family units. Many young men and women are growing, out without, growing up without fathers in their homes. And that's resulting in all kinds of problems. So dads, what you do is awesome. What you do is important. But you got to have the right priorities. You got to know your purpose. You got to have the right plan in all of that, and God will bless that. Uh, think about how it worked for all the, um, all the people in our, in our story here. It, it works the same way. Uh, they had to have that moment of, am I going to seek God, or am I going to seek something else? I like this example right here. I went to the Global Leadership Summit a couple years ago, and I was introduced to Erwin uh, McManus, uh, who is an author and a pastor. And he shared from his own life, and it, and it really impacted me in a way. And he wrote this book just previously that's called The Last Arrow. And uh, what the book is about is, it, the subtitle says, Save Nothing for the Next Life. What the book is about is, is giving it your best, giving it your all now for the glory of God, living for God, leaving it all uh, on the field, if you would, for, for playing field. And it's an awesome, I recommend the book to you. I got a lot out of it, but I, I loved listening to him as well. And, and so here's, here's what he said. He started the book out this way, sharing from his own story. He said, it was Thursday, December 15th, 2016, when I sat across from the desk of my doctor and heard him say the words we hope to never hear, you have cancer. The signs had been there for years, but the news was still unexpected. I made the decision, he said, that while cancer may define how I die, it would not define how I live. Boy, that's powerful. Cancer may define how I die. We don't always get to choose that. But I can choose how I live. And I'm going to use all my arrows up to use his metaphor from Scripture there. And I'm going to do it all for the glory of God. He responded, you see, to this huge trial by seeking God. And what blessings in disguise. And one of those blessings was him writing this book. One of the blessings is him speaking and sharing his story with many others. And I got so much out of that session. Here's a few things. I went back in my notes, and I looked at some of the things that I, I wrote in my notes from his talk that day. Freedom is on the other side of your fears. Your greatness is on the other side of your pain. 
Your future is on the other side of your failure. Live each day as if it is the last. And this one really stuck with me. You're not ready to live until you're ready to die. Wow. He said that was such a wake-up call for him when he basically was given a death sentence with his cancer. I think it was stage four cancer that he was diagnosed with. And uh, he said once he was ready to die, he was finally ready to live in his life. Let me ask you today. Are you ready? Are you ready to die? Are you ready to live? If today was the day, and it could be that Jesus came back, see all this stuff that's happening right now, the Bible talks about birth pangs, the end times, we could be living in the end times. We don't know all that's going on. It could be today. Jesus could come back today. This could be our last day. Are you ready? Jesus said, I'll come at an hour and a day when you don't know and you're not looking for me. Are you ready? You need to be ready. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Have you left it all on the field? Have you, have you been playing for him or have you been wasting, not having clarity? Wrong priorities in your life. Are you ready to die? You see, you're not really ready to die until you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because when it's all over, there are only two choices. Heaven or hell. Eternity with Christ in bliss and glory and blessing or eternity separated from him in a place called hell, which is a place of suffering and torment. But if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you see, that's why he died on the cross. He died on the cross for your sins so you could be forgiven and have a relationship with him and go to heaven when you die. That's how you get prepared. You have to receive Jesus. And then once you're prepared, then you, your eyes are open. That's when clarity comes. You lose your life to find it, and, and then you start to live for him. But it's easy, right, folks? It's easy to take your eyes off the Lord. It's easy to ignore him in the midst of trials and difficulties. It's easy to get distracted with other things and not live fully for him. And so if you're going to be totally ready to die, you need to live for the Lord, and you need to be fully committed to the Lord. Are you ready today? Part of my job is to get you ready, <laughs> to stir you up. Say, hey, you can do it. Get in the game. Get it done. Make your life count for eternity. That's what I desire for you. That's what God wants for us. That's what God wants to come out of our trials, our difficulties, this time of life, this season of life. He wants us to reevaluate what are our priorities? What are we living for? What's most important? What am I focusing on? So go back. What is the key to clarity? It's our response. We're all going to have trials, right? We're all going to have trials. It comes. The question is, how are we going to respond to that? And that's what's going to determine or drive the result. So let me just real quickly here. Our time is almost gone. But real quickly, let me give you two ways that you can respond, that you can seek God in the midst of all of this. Number one, seek God through his word. I know it's like a broken record, right? Week after week, get in the Word, spend time with God. Oh. But there's nothing that replaces that. Psalm 119, 105, your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of your Word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Uh, the picture here is like driving in in. in in dark, intense fog. Have you ever done that? Uh, very hard, right? You're just scared. You can hardly see in front of you. Sometimes you have to pull over and just wait or crawl or, or whatever, you know? But that's how we are in this life. We're kind of in this fog until we read God's word and then it, it clears up in front of us. God's word helps us to see. It's a light unto our path and it directs our steps. It gives us understanding and that's God's purpose in it all. Uh, I like this story. Let me just share this one too because it goes along with this point. One of my blessings in disguise started when you first came to Southern Lakes. 
He started us on Bible memory. That moved me to start giving my first fruits to the Lord each day. That moved me to studying the word more. That moved me to a better and deeper prayer life, and that led me to listening to the Holy Spirit more, which all resulted in a closer walk with the Lord. I am far from perfect, but the, Lord's, uh, the Lord wakes me up each day without an alarm to spend time with him and start my day out right. Isn't that awesome? I felt the Lord with me and am content in the Lord through all the pandemic. All of these things have helped me to stay focused on him during these unprecedented times that we find ourselves in. Wow, I, I just couldn't say it any better how powerful that God has given us his word to seek him and that's what happens and we have that focus, we have that clarity that comes. Here's another way, seek God through prayer. And these two go hand in hand. Uh, Jeremiah 29 and verse 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search with me with part of your heart. Oh, no, no, I didn't say that right. Uh, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with some of your heart. No. All. When you search for all of your heart, right? Are you there? That's what prayer is. Prayer is beautiful. I, I've shared this with you before, but for me, uh, I love prayer walking, and there's times when I feel like I'm in the fog, and I got a decision to make, or there's something major going on, or a trial gets thrown at me. It's like, whoa, what is this about? I, I just go for a prayer walk, and I talk with God, and there's something about being outside and just communing with God and all of that, and it has a way of just screwing my head back on, you know? And so by the end of my prayer walk, I just feel like, wow, I have, I have new clarity that I've never had before. Sometimes I'll be writing a sermon, I just like hit that that brick wall, you know what I mean? Writer's block kind of thing. And I'll just go out and think and pray and, and walk and I come back and I got, you know, four more sermons or something like that, you know? Just clarity comes with all that because that's how prayer works. Seeking God, fasting and praying and just spending time with him. Ask God for discernment, slow down, simplify, take retreats. All those things will help us to get clarity. Here's another story that, that goes along with this. Thank you so much for your sermon on blessings in disguise. It is exactly what I needed to hear at exactly the right time. Isn't that how it often is? Some people say, well, you're speaking just directly to me. Well, that's not me. I don't know your life, what's going on, but God does. And God will use his, his word and his spirit to speak to our hearts, and that's what happens. My grandma passed away on May 3rd. Not of COVID, but of pneumonia and CHF. She was 98 years old and died alone in a nursing home. And just think about that. That just hurts my heart. She died alone. My visit to see her in early March was canceled due to the quarantine. I'm really struggling with this, and I can see why. That's a trial. But there's a choice, right? What did this person do? I needed to be reminded of the blessings in disguise. My son came home from college mid-March. He's a sophomore in college, and I don't know when the next time he'll be home for such an extended time. Right now, when he, when he got home from school, I realized what a gift this was for me. I'm so thankful for this extra time with him and all my family. One more. I can feel myself drawing near to God and relying on him to get me through each day. The sermon reminds me to adjust my thinking, attitude, and focus. There's hope. You see, we all have that same option, right? We can either seek God and find that blessing in disguise, or we can ignore God and totally miss it, no matter what the trial is, no matter how difficult it is. The key to clarity, again, is what? Seeking God. And this is where we all need to be. We don't want to ignore God. It's too easy to do. But God's going to bring that clarity in our lives. God's going to give us a renewed sense of purpose and focus if we respond to him. Now, how many of you have ever had a near-death experience in your life? Okay, a few of you out there. I've had several. <laughs> I've been sharing them with you along the way. I shared one a couple of weeks ago, the accident that I had. But yeah, when you live a life kind of like I do, you, you have lots of near-death experiences, I guess. And one of them happened to me when I was, uh, I was a, a young man, teenager. I was hanging out with a friend of mine, 
And uh, I was over at his place, and uh, he, he was showing me his handgun. Oh, that's cool. That's nice, whatever. And he put it up to my head. I said, dude, don't do that, man. That, you know, that thing could be loaded or something. He goes, there's nothing in it. Look, boom. And at that point, you know, we both had to get some new trousers on and that kind of thing. He goes, whoa, I didn't know it was loaded. He was ready, he was ready to click that right to my head just, you know, for the fun of it. He, did, he had no idea that there was, there was a bullet in the chamber. It's like, whoa. And then years later, I was still with the same guy. You know, I probably should have probably should have learned my lesson, right? I should have run, run from that guy, right? I, I, I told you a couple weeks ago, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, okay? So that's what happens. So I'm still hanging out with him, and, and we had way too much to drink, and, and we shouldn't have been drinking, and we shouldn't have been driving, and, and he was driving, and, and we were out in his car, and he took off just speeding down the highway, and uh, he didn't navigate the curve. So we went off, and we went into this farmer's uh, cow yard, ended up in a big pile of you-know-what, and uh, I still remember that all too well. But, but here's the thing. Looking back, and what we found out later is we just barely, by inches, missed a big corner post that that farmer had in that was anchoring the whole cow yard and so forth. And if we'd have hit that thing, we'd have been done. You see, times like that make you think. And I think God used several of those to get through to me, to make me think in my life. And it works the same way with you. Makes you think about what's really important. Clarity. COVID-19. <clears throat> Some of you are saying, oh, it doesn't affect me a bit. No problem. <laughs> you know, it's all made up. It's a conspiracy. You know, whatever. Others of you are like, it's been major disruption, major life-altering stuff. But even beyond that, in your everyday life, some of you right now, I don't know what you're going through, but God does. You might be going through some really heavy stuff right now. You have a choice. Seek God, and you'll be found. You'll see his blessings, and you'll see those blessings, maybe not even disguised, they'll just be simultaneous with all that God is doing. And that's what he's trying to bring about in your life. Now, I don't know what your next steps are. I don't know how God wants you to apply the message today. Uh, maybe he just wants you to come to him and receive him as Savior. Maybe he wants you to get back on track with right or better priorities. Maybe dads, make the application to you again, he wants you to really focus on home in a new and better way and be the dad that he's called you to be, right? Right? It goes so fast, guys, so fast. And nobody can do it for you. And so you gotta pay attention. You gotta have your head in the game and focus on what's really important. But all of us, right? All of us, no matter what's going on right now, God wants to use this to bring us to himself, to help us be clear on our priorities and focus. I want to close uh, the message at least, and we're going to have communion right after that, but I want to close the message uh, with a special prayer for our dads. So if you're a dad in the service this morning, would you please stand up right now, all the dads, and I just want to close with a, uh, a prayer for you. And thank you, by the way. Uh, I know you could have gone to the, the church on the green or the church on the lake, and you know that can wait till later or whatever, but you chose to be here, and, and that's awesome and that's important and god's going to bless you for that and again just the priority in it all so uh, would you join me in praying for them and just praying for the message to apply to our lives god thank you for being an awesome father for all of us and loving us so and i thank you for each father that is represented here and maybe watching or listening online as well god i pray that they'd be filled with your father heart of love, of understanding, wisdom. Give them all they need, Father, to be the parents that they need to be, to be in the moment, to be the grandparent they need to be. I pray, Father, for that unconditional love, that wisdom, that patience, the kindness. I pray for quality time and quantity time and all those things, God, wisdom and priorities and 
being able to get through and capture the hearts of their children. Father, we look to you, we seek you, knowing you are the answer. And I pray that all of us would be clear on our priorities, whether it's fatherhood or whatever it might be, and we would be quick to give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people together said, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, uh, we want to turn our attention to communion, and uh, I just want to say up front, we've never done it quite this way before, uh, and so please work with me on this, and I'm learning, okay? So you can learn right along with me. You received uh, a packet on the way in this morning of the elements, and, and let me walk you through this, okay? It's not quite like flipping the ketchup packet, okay? because you gotta start out this way. There's a little cellophane wrapper on the top, tiny, tiny cellophane wrapper, and you pull that back first, and if you pull it back like that, kinda like a ketchup wrapper, then you'll be able to pull the bread out of it right there, okay? So go ahead and do that. Just pull the cellophane back first, not the big tab. It's the tiny cellophane right there. Then you'll get that piece. Then you can take the big tab and like a ketchup packet, at that point, carefully, and it's hard, you got to slowly but surely pull it back, try not to spill it on your neighbor, and get that back as well, and then you're all ready, okay? And when you've got both of those done, would you just hold it up so I can see when we're about ready to move on, okay? Most of you got it. Super. If I wait for the rest of you, it's going to be 3 o'clock this afternoon, and it could be tough there. All right. So let's turn our attention back uh, to the symbols and what they represent. The bread represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins. His broken body, he, he suffered and he died in our place. It should have been us, but it was him. Uh, I want to go back, if I could, could we put the words to uh, bound back on the screen, the very first uh, verse of that, the song that Josiah wrote and highlighted first. I was thinking about this as we were singing this morning. He took my sin, he bore my shame, he paid it all for me so my heart could be changed. That's what it's all about. The juice is representative of his blood that cleanses us from our sin. He gave his life. The life is in the blood. And so let's remember today, this is a memorial. Let's remember what he has done for us. If you're watching at home, you can just grab some elements right there and participate as well, some crackers and some juice. Just bow your heads and give thanks. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, thank him for what he's done for you. The Bible says the Lord Jesus took the bread and he broke it, and he blessed it, and he said, this body is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. And in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for your broken body and your shed blood. Thank you that we can come back to what is important to remember the priority of the gospel in our lives, what you have done for us, why we are here to share that good news with others, to live out that good news every day. Help us, Father, to be crystal clear on that. Thank you so much for your love, your faithfulness, and all that you're doing in our midst. And we're going to continue to praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please hang on to those and just drop them in the baskets. Uh, there's some baskets on both sides uh, on your way out this morning, and uh, that'll be a big help to us there. Let me invite you to stand as uh, we're dismissed, give you a final blessing this morning. Again, I want to say thank you, dads, and happy Father's Day. Whatever you have planned, enjoy your day. Um, 
Uh, don't forget to bless your dads uh, wherever they are. Call them up or do whatever. Uh, you can uh, connect with them. Go visit them if you can, that kind of thing. And uh, let's continue to give God the glory for all that he has done, giving us great dads and great dads in this church as well. So thank you, uh, all, all of you men. So let me leave you with this final blessing. <clears throat> May the Lord Jesus Christ make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Uh, may you see his purpose, his plan for your life. And may you fulfill that this coming week. Step into it fully, embracing the trials, the difficulties, but honoring God in the midst that he may do great things in and through you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Happy Father's Day, everybody.